Hello everyone, today we talk about the 6th, 17th century Mediterranean trade and production, like a broader economic take on from, from archaeological sources mostly and the problem of their interpretation. As you know, I don't um, spend m much of my, my time learning about these things, but they are important after all because material culture does have a relevance if it were only in proving how extremely complicated any kind of reconstruction on the base of it um, touching kind of broader political social issues this actually is right and when we talk about this phase Mediterranean history first of all today we will not even distinguish the um, say pre and post Islamic invasion phase albeit this was a bit the conceptual framework uh, m set as you know by Henri uh, Pirenne whose work has become the paradigm of uh, all the, the phrases such as you know uh, Pirenne's thesis by a certain degree is still valid but it must be integrated with the uh, historiographical uh, new acquisitions, historiographically archaeological. Well, the point of Pirenne's thesis uh, is is that it it it, tr it still makes us talk, for the simple reason that, as you know, he basically highlighted in a relatively sharp fashion. I made videos about Pirenne's thesis, the drop of Mediterranean, inter-Mediterranean, and also kind of broader intercontinental trade uh, with with the Islamic invasions proper and also thus distinguishing the pre and post phases as two very different in, in dynamic right and Piran wrote lots of interesting things He's one of those historians who began to realize the importance of economy as an independent um, say object of studying in, uh, for, for our historiographical interpretation, the theory has been widely criticized because, in many ways, um, this is not true, right? This is not true because, essentially, if you look at the trade flows, this had contracted importantly, and or at least um, with a, with a, with a, with a not for, for obvious reasons, right? The fact that, for example, the West didn't really exist anymore, even just as a state, right? Um, and so all this major intercontinental trade, etc., was at least not regulated in the same way it was before, and thus also uh, there were lots of problems for the local communities that had impoverished, especially with the Gothic War and, and other issues, let's say the, the, the pandemic, etc., to uh, to spend so much for such long-range trade and so th there had been also massive demographic contraction etc so whatever happened and lots of people debate about all this right they say no it's not true because we found out I don't know that in the second half of the sixth century there is this um, research on let's say the, the pollen on certain specific provinces in Anatolia and they show that the climate or let's say the local agricultural production hadn't changed uh, along these sandy spanners. These things are um, let's say in my opinion let's say they are useful if they are carried out systematically on a very wide and kind of very thoroughly explained kind of valuable amount of evidence right that in by by scholars that are not just trying to sell their own product by shouting things that are practically and actually not true this is done by historians uh, but I must say it, it's more the case among archaeologists because they need more money actually to carry out their research and so there is a massive investment also on what you must find by a certain degree which very often entails even the destruction say they're, they're searching for classical stuff so since there is a much greater quest for classical stuff if they find I don't know an early medieval wall that uh, prevents them from digging further into some something ancient they simply tear it apart they don't say anything to the local authorities 
uh, they act as if they are archaeologists and actually they're just criminals that should be shot on the spot uh, and uh, because th you cannot afford like we should stop pretending that human life is more important than history and historical legacy and heritage and culture and universal values right we should really start to have this conversation because um, history is not done well right archaeology is not done well and therefore whenever we have eventually to sum up things because we have to teach children we have to teach um, also adults ab about all these things we need a clear pattern we don't need a mob that fundamentally just uh, needs to stay afloat in a world in which they haven't learned how how to because they've been spoiled by being parasitically maintained um, and they can't even adapt to to crisis right which is one of the greatest like if if you cannot ad adapt to crisis in many ways um, it, it's not because there is any uh, deterministic factor about it. It's because you're a whiner, right? Uh, even if you, you know, the worst happens, right? By a certain degree, you should have thought about that. And if you cannot cope with it and uh, solve the problem, I don't care, frankly. Um, and in many ways, um, we are going to witness, in fact, a great change, even in the way we make history. I mean, this... Um, fortunately enough, I think this overflow of cheap uh, historical, archaeological, whatever, this all these call for, calls for papers are completely useless. The, the quality declined dramatically. Will hopefully contract because ever less people will start studying these things. And even in, if this may be a problem on, on the broader spectrum, it may, after all, bring with time with the emergence of kind of more competent people, right? It is true that the already existing scholars were just entrenched into an ivory tower in the process, but still, uh, that cannot sustain itself without a base, especially if the base was exclusively the aforementioned system. So, in my, in my view, um, there are, of course, lots of things that we should m make as a premise regarding to this video, but let's just to say in general that today we s we will stick to the just to the uncertainty of the whole thing. That is what how much can we get in which measure from say very you know material based evidence. Ceramics, all this kind of stuff. You say, oh no Sparpunk please it's so boring. Yes I know it does sound boring, but it's actually interesting. If you understand again that we are actually criticizing that in a sense. So if you are you should be interested in this otherwise you're lost too in the in the broader oblivion and you don't want to do that right? and and Schwerpunk will be your mean of salvation well skipping this messianic premises um, the point being that um, archaeology at least for a long time went on um, through let's say appearance pattern right it would be you would think the opposite, right? It would be archeo mostly historians that would follow because they, they haven't studied the archaeological stuff. In, in many ways, it's been the other way around, right? Historians have been more critical of Perrin's thesis in general because, in general, we are also more habituated to uh, a much uh, and mo enormously more dramatic, um, I say, greater amount dramatically greater amount of information to sort out than just single or even multiple archaeological finds and that's why a materialistic bias is, is really not advisable and unfortunately um, archaeology does have this right uh, they shouldn't right uh, there are brilliant archaeologists they are great some are very open-minded uh, intelligent scientifically educated people but again, in my experience, the the average, also the one of the average historian for that matter, always displays that kind of materialistic attitude, never more in you know in a subject such as archaeology. Um, in any case, there have been naturally lots of other uh, evidence coming around, uh, a really a reinvigoration, a continuous transfusion 
of new archaeological data throughout the last half century um, and more and naturally ever more refined means of dating of classification also broader you know digitalization also helps dramatically in any case um, the broader outlook on for example urbanization rural settlement or whatever of course by it being ever clearer in relative terms is still extremely complicated in absolute terms to assess we obviously can understand by looking at specific ceramic let's say where whether okay it was made somewhere we find it somewhere else at that point and we can see how how frequent that type of find is. We can classify it. We can um, say assess the the obvious. The problem again is that we often don't know how this was in relation to the rest. Also, because what we find is not, as we'll see now, necessarily entire. Say not necessarily the, the same the entirety of the story. Because as you understand, only certain products kind of. Uh, survive time at least they do easier more easily than than others but in general uh, we lack the quantities overall or even when we can have a scale of that we, we don't necessarily have means to compare even with places that maybe had a big deal of traffic of the same things but that for some reason didn't preserve them uh, so easily so today we will not even enter into that degree of specificity where again archaeology can easily um, and help a lot to understand um, more and better and that can surely say something sensible uh, about uh, the, the broader, some broader pattern. So that being definitive about certain specific um, patterns is, is complicated. Again I will not touch this topic thoroughly so obviously I will not explain today what we really mean. In any case um, there can be naturally for example in relative terms there are some sites that are studied better than, than others normally. Certain economic relationships that are studied better than others. Um, again particular sites that are much better provided or that, that with evidence or simply that have been discovered earlier for completely random reasons um, naturally there is further exploration where you may think there's there may be more right through field survey that again all has its own methodology and you know that is also debated there are different approaches and so on uh, we can look at also other indicators that are really that sounds useful in a broader, in a broader sense. I mean, first of all, documentary sources are still kind of the the richest source ever, right? Um, there is no, as for these times especially, there is no doubt. Even though uh, it, it seems scanny from a historical point of view, but it's surely much more to the point than archaeological evidence. But some archaeological evidence also, of course, reflects. Uh, macroscopically the fact that I don't know certain era was particularly developed if you look at the limestone massive of northern Syria uh, and you look at the local structures and how they were built say in fact between the 6th and 7th century it was quite important and active and province of the Byzantine Empire and it was heavily involved since you know since ever at least in in the last millennium in a very large scale kind of connection it's very far away even transcontinental trade of course on very long long distances but you understand uh, it would connect fundamentally Mesopotamia with 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 the Mediterranean and also very far away places we know how much cheaper it was to uh, to to transport goods uh, on water as opposed to on land and that's why the Mediterranean in this 
called as any other waterway so it's so crucial and you understand that you know being the, the most developed um, economies at the time there and being a well-defined kind of lake you can say um, that was essentially controlled up to Islamic invasions by um, a single empire practically well it, that, that was also naturally mostly a coast on an urban one so any other people in Europe in Asia say in, in the Near East in, uh, in North Africa was somewhat connected with that trade uh, and today we don't talk about this either but say there are immediate hinterlands that at this point kind of don't even belong literally to the empire at least they, the empire couldn't have really a direct control such as the Balkans, Italy, the Iberian Peninsula uh, even the yeah I mean other parts for example of um, for think about the Near Eastern interland or or at a point the same Egypt because again these are the times in which the the eastern provinces of the empire are always rebelling so that Constantinople has to be a bit equilibristic also regarding its uh, theological policy literally uh, and flexible with them so there is really a lot going on and um, could be at that point enough to to stop saying we we don't know practically anything from a material point of view what the hell we're even talking about because the system is too complex and the evidence is not enough but again if one looks at those impressive buildings say in places like Syria so you're real like built at that time you realize surely there was but it was mostly local right there wasn't uh, um, but in the Roman Empire in general like most uh, resources had been employed yes the the major ones the most um, massive were part of the, the imperial uh, the imperial policy, but the um, the broader let's say the amount of local buildings infrastructure was fundamentally paid for by the local elites, and this is how it had always been working. Um, should also well, okay. I'll talk about this later. So when you look at the archaeological finds um, and uh, analyze them uh, regarding the trying to find the production and distribution of certain manufactured goods, you can rely only on single types, such as, for example, we have thousands upon thousands of shreds of pottery right that was useless to its owners once uh, it was broken but invaluable to archaeologists because um, when this pottery remains on the ground it's practically indestructible right so it survives the ages and it allows thus this in in important detail because the finds are a bit everywhere scattered really everywhere um, the um, let's say the detailed study at least of this wide areas right and given that pottery was a traded commodity in its own right in part this tracks um, for example the exchange of foodstuff which in antiquity were routinely transported in ceramic amphorae including such Mediterranean dietary staples as olive oil, wine, fish sauce that were in fact pretty much um, you know a common good, a broad scale good and this yet was in fact exported from certain Mediterranean areas to others naturally true there also in the interland and naturally today uh, we have um, a pretty large capacity of assigning for example a lot of this ceramic material to a specific region of production right there are yes kind of uncertainties but 
this still allows from to, for a classification and dating, at least of the most common and widely exchanged ceramic types. We're looking just at a fraction of the uh, of the typology of products, and also of the entire flow. Right? Always bear this in mind. You can say, "Oh, I can say we have lots." of that ceramics, right? So we, we know kind of no because you can find them scattered everywhere in pretty large amounts, but those are not going to be even a a significant part, let's say, of the entire volume. It can however tell you something about that. And so there you start working about that too. But again, we mostly go by conjectures, certainly we that cannot be simply cancelled. There is no absolute point of arrival. You can improve in absolute terms, but then there is just without certain specific evidence, not too much you can you can say. Um, naturally there is m much about ceramic assemblages in, in the in the work too, right? Um, which can reveal patterns of consumption, for example which, however, is also quite uh, absurd by, by a degree, right? You can, again, see it in a, in a, you know, you can point out how these ceramics were, were broken in a way to find out, let's say, how they could have been used, stored, thrown away, but at the same time, you know, do you really? Can you really fully know how this applies for the entire picture, and or whether are, are you really sure that they broke? Now, maybe the way you do it, it's it's just hypothesis most of the times. And naturally, this mostly sticks to just a a given site most of the times, not necessarily the uh, the entire uh, entire picture. For example, there is the late 7th century depot at the Crypta Balbi in Rome uh, that definitely shows um, through the, the amphorae um, that uh, it contains where, based on the type where this stuff arrived and considered this is late century Rome. So in theory this should be kind of one of basically the, the allegedly darkest time in in uh, in medieval history and also com compared to, to late uh, to, to antiquity in general well at the crypto balba you find amphorae that come from Carthage that come from uh, Asia Minor from the Aegean Sea uh, from from Anth uh, from from Syria from from Palestine from Egypt right so this is Rome in the late 7th century. Consider that the contacts between Rome and these areas at the time are still witnessed. So naturally Rome was, in theory at this point, it was really governed by the local aristocracies and by the papacy already. The, the Byzantine presence was um, always somewhat um, autonomous um, if there were officials and troops sent from Constantinople or other areas of the empire still it was the local Roman militia fundamentally that that took over at that point and um, we are still looking in fact at a, at a city of the empire right Rome is not really a coastal city it's well connected however with the sea uh, through through the river and it has a, a dramatic position uh, in the uh, in Mediterranean in that regard and so it can easily maintain that connection of course uh, finds are also from from Sicily from southern Italy the 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 papacy had an important amount of latifundia there still uh, I talked about this in the uh, Byzantine Sicily video that I made last spring if I'm not wrong so we are told a story in this case, and the, the the Arab invasions have already began here, right? So 
it, of course, they haven't reached as far as, you know, as Constantinople or, or North Africa yet, but still, there is a continuity witnessed also in, um, for, with Near Eastern contact, apparently. Uh, naturally, the amphorae do not mean that they to be found that are found are necessarily to be stored from a recent time. I don't know the the details of this. An archaeologist could about this specific site, but um, as you understand, there is a um, broader you know range of uh, connections here that was not over at all. Naturally the finds are also similar among each other, right? The typologies of uh, of the amphorae and other uh, containers, let's say, are somewhat similar. There are certain specific, now, let's say, the, the, the African one, as we will see, are peculiar, the Carthaginian one, let's say, better. Um, but um, in general, we are talking about some finds that probably are really standard all over the Mediterranean, right, may have been also in part produced even in the same Italy or somewhere, I don't know, in Spain, places like this. So that what do we get from this initial amount of evidence? Well, there is one aspect here that is useful, really. That is to say, we can document archaeologically some mass of evidence in specific sites mostly, but as broader serial data of um, in, in some areas that are not documented otherwise. That is to say, if there is no written record about a certain trade uh, connection about certain production, etc. Of course, um, as you know, sources of this high mostly we're talking about chronicles or you know, other fragments in letters, etc. We can, we, normally they don't talk about these things, right? They can witness connections and of course they can make us understand whether these areas were in, in trade relations, etc. And we, generally speaking, expect this from the general mechanism of the local economy. So, uh, but it, it's very relevant to see that we can trace some trade flows that Otherwise, we don't have any surviving written record of, and that therefore, you know, just indicatively, we hadn't been brought through historiography to, to know about, right? So archaeology in this sense comes in quite useful play. But paradoxically, when we know that there is trade between two areas, uh, and we find the ceramics, say, that witness that because objectively we see that okay they were produced there we know that on the base of previous archaeological information etc we, we know they were exported here uh, we knew about this trade relation do we know actually more about this amount of evidence like no because most of the times we don't know how much this amounts to really um, and what was the broader exchange in a, in, a, in absolute terms and how intertwined with the with the overall trade and, and economy production system so is it you know does it really add so much to that broader to the construction of that broader net uh, not so much compared to what we knew already right we just can document it materially right and so that of course consolidates to our our certainty about our rel relative security about such such trait in existence. Ceramic distributions can be used to reveal so not merely the existence of exchange networks but also their evolution over time. This is complicated but of course uh, at the rawest level if we see some ceramics from a given generation and then the ceramics suddenly stop in the following ones never to reappear and we know they were produ produced somewhere etc we, we we don't know let's say necessarily the reason why like if we know i don't know that the province was conquered um or an order was some government change in, in the first place were some wars going on but well maybe we can't 
associate the two things, but we don't know whether maybe the you know there was some broader reason. Maybe there were some other local trade initiatives that changed um, the direction of that flow. We may never know, and we are not documented about this anyway. Um, and consider that when we, we're not just talking about Mediterranean areas, right? We, we say Mediterranean, of course, because we we talk about the broader region, but also parts of the the interland, right? So very often, again, we have a pretty scattered amount of evidence uh, of uh, different sites, right? If you were, for example, even through graphs. Uh, just highlighting the sites where, say, for example, the fine spots of African red slip were, uh, were found in Italy, right? You have many places, um, and of course, first of all, you should say how much fines do we have for all these places? There are many, right? A stretch from literally all across modern the modern country, like from Sardinia to Sicily, um, but even apparently here you can't really say that for example in central or southern Italy there is a, a greater distribution just along the coasts right you find this where also for example concentrated in, in the northwest uh, there isn't much in the central Po Valley but if we're talking about th just the given finds and why right there is also some Indians in the northeast uh, so you have to make a, just a hypothesis of why could be the case and maybe again these are just the finds that we found but what about the others like if we were to magically uh, unveil all the archaeological events oh my god but do, do you have an idea especially about the early middle ages and especially in southern europe of how much like we're talking about entire cities that existed that that we don't know uh, uh even that they in fact they ever existed or that we thought they had at least contracted in uh, at least this is less frequent because we have um, at least you know if, if the city existed before and it was a major archaeological find we can still dig around and find something but let's say there are cities that we literally maybe we know they were on the map but they were they were never found practically uh, and so we sometimes or that were not even truly mapped and so through the sources that we have at our disposal, but that were there and that change a big deal, especially in terms of local trade network, because the question is, uh, again, we, we assume at a certain point Piran contributed to this idea that um, this entire area underwent some sort of cataclysm or at least that uh, there was a, a, a deep break with antiquity at some point. Well. The more archaeology studies this area, the more, first of all, it realizes not just that it wasn't like that, but that basically we don't have much of an idea of what, what it was really like at the time. So you think, again, you live in the 21st century. In the West, you think we, we study our own history and this is basically it, right? No, we still have to find a lot. In this sense, archaeology is, is brutally efficient. Because again, there there are there have been also recently entire cities that have been uncovered, literally, and maybe there were cities that were just, I don't know, ten kilometers, or okay, I'm just saying something r random like this, or a few kilometers next to to the center that we know today or that we think, and it maybe had moved in the meanwhile, um, at the time, say in early medieval times, in other. Mo and or in other moments or and or maybe lit there were literal towns there i i know people that make these studies and basically they realize that um we have not even began to to tell the story and that we're going mostly by some accounts in this sense that there is not an abuse of his of, of written record but let's say the idea that of course until you don't, you you find something um and you don't have any other evidence uh talking materially you have to rely mostly on the written records and again if the, in the written records uh, a, a town a city even was skipped well you had to to consider that and these were heavily populated areas uh, and heavily urbanized ones as well so 
this is actually much easier to find compared for example to I don't know uh, northern European settlements of the time that as think about the, the main trade posts in the Baltic and during the Viking era well, the Viking era finishes these places went inhabited so just think even in previous times etc how much we don't we don't know right in relative term in, in absolute and in relative terms about the local communities about the the population dynamics and all these kind of things this is actually one of the most powerful indicators as well and again if you just stick to what we found banally you can have the same distortion doesn't matter that we, we are plenty of ceramics have we even actually found all the places where we should be searching for no because it also costs a lot again archaeological excavations are very very costly and so we can't simply do it and that's also the reason why this is a huge problem actually also for modern countries to to spend enough not even just for excavations but for maintaining their cultural heritage right uh, it's um, there are countries that objectively cannot because it's too much think about the same Italian peninsula this is the single most archaeologically stratified region in the world for not talking about the concentration of stuff simply again what kind of budget should you use like the entire European Union should should pay billions and billions just to, to start doing something decent uh, the single country can't can't make it right this is valid at large basically for most countries in Europe right you, you don't really have enough resources to dedicate satisfactorily to your cultural to the per preserving your cultural heritage and that's why also talking about it uh, is um, is crucial just to be aware of that we are not kind of museum countries where you know it's all there and that's it there is still all to dig uh, and and it's insane right because we could make a living in part also with a much greater amount of stuff and so publicizing also our our cultural heritage is 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 radically important not just selling bullshit um, sell historical things uh, like you know to, to attract dumb ignorant and educated tourists I'm talking about making of cultural heritage everywhere in the world just something extremely worth preserving in a concrete sense and especially where it gets down to, to the history of it now there are so many problems about this the method that we have just illustrated because um, of course as we just said archaeological evidence is restricted in scope is always kind of open to reinterpretation as the written sources are historians and archaeologists don't talk to each other nor any other <laughs> you know uh, profession really does so we're done for in, um, at, at this point uh, because this should be the moment of intensification instead it's the moment of uh, shrinking um, and there can't be any further there will be another era we will start doing these things good well and not just for sponsoring you know some incompetent idiots that want to be publicized about whatever they they fake about having found underground uh, so the problem remains also that in, in the fact that uh, some of the other very relevant uh, trade goods in early medieval times such as spices or slaves are not archaeologically retrievable how many s slaves have we found and we don't know they were actually slaves or they had been because it could also be spices spices you can find traces of them at least normally uh, instead they were extremely uh, expansive as you know uh, they were also an elite thing uh, they were consumed and they were long range goods um, to be traded so uh, how much did they account right also the type of containers we described before 
uh, that uh, that circulated next, uh, say, alongside the amphorae. We're talking about barrels, sacks, and skins normally survive in the ground. So what about those? Those really transported very important and also kind of, you know, a, a very important volume, if anything, of goods. The production and distribution of materials such as glass, building stone, is also possible to reconstruct right through the recovered materials. Um, and uh, as you understand, that's also, however, more uh, more difficult to do. It's also these are also less frequent finds, or at least they are more difficult to. Um, to attribute at least especially building stone by a certain degree uh, to, um, to, to to attach them to certain areas specifically maybe it's just even glass considering how less frequently is, is um, to be found compared to ceramics to the, the more difficult one I, I don't know just we have to accept in a broader sense that ceramic evidence is the unavoidable base, the dominating base of our um, perception of archaeology of in, in the post-Roman Mediterranean economy. So naturally this poses further problems because course it's not uh, say ceramics as we've seen were connected to certain to certain other product exports imports that were quite important but it, it's not the entire picture at all right so we also in, in terms of trade balance and so on still however it's better than nothing of course much better than nothing as a matter of fact because we think still that whenever we look at the ceramics exports even with all the relative and absolute problems that we listed we are still looking at the broader substratum or the broader base of the wider economic trade by the way I'm talking a lot about trade but the, the broader problem of course is economy altogether that is to say how do we know otherwise, again, archaeologically speaking, about local economy if we don't actually look at these products? We, c we can look, of course, at lots of other things, telling the truth from uh, the just the, the working sites, the, uh, the, the same farms. I mean, everything that was also production site per se. But um, at the same time, uh, trade reveals much about the surplus and so also what could be uh, attached to uh, some kind of more developed economy Can, we can't say with greater security okay this this was something more developed than other areas that was still active and so may have a lot of other broader political and social implications in the process right pottery is an everyday commodity and is manufactured throughout the late antique world to a range of specifications that extend from standardized fine wares disseminated in vast quantities from North Africa to basic hand-shaped vessels produced within the households for domestic use and you know that there is a, an important divide between the two patterns of ceramic production and distribution can therefore shed light however upon all tiers of the economy if properly interpreted and properly selected from the international to the local and the relative sophistication of the pottery industry is probably also a reliable index of the general complexity of the contemporary economy right if the pottery is more expansive and it is also generally speaking presenting some patterns of um, or presenting some patterns of standardization this all tells us something specific 
about that kind of economy. Uh, in periods where high quality pottery could be mass produced and widely distributed, in fact, it seems reasonable to assume that other industries specializing in everyday items such as textiles or timber were capable of operating on a similar level because the uh, this was basically in fact the the average um, and so what would be affordable by by the common people and so uh, you wouldn't have much of a divide between uh, you would have the same type of interest uh, proportionally in, in that more or less that the same amount of quality this is a bit like today in our economy right you, if you want to economize you have a general unless you have a specific you know um, in fact o occupation or specialization in fact which is rarer compared to uh, you know which was rarer at the time compared to now well you can low say have this lower um, lower quality of a role to be found just like in the household in general which increases as we we're saying before the likelihood of these products to be exported because the surplus was higher evenly said when you see a reliance on local manufacturers well tendentially at least one would think either of an absence of demand um, or of the transport of marketing structures required for regional pottery distribution. And so this would speak of simpler economic systems, except it's not always clear even here how, let's say, rich or poor that the average background uh, really was from the product that still was relatively uh, you know that there is not a massive difference the way that an amphora can be made right and still again what about the volume it could transport um, what about you know the fact that we're talking about just specific evidence specific size we don't know exactly who produced them what for even if we track where they came from in a way and so it's all very complex the, the reuse too could be a very interesting view point as well however it's obvious that when we look at the 6th the 7th century we're also witnessing a, a process of gradual contraction and so this was also going on from quite a while so before Piran uh, actually suggests there had been a major contraction actually before the Arabs um, this contraction had already happened in fact it was I don't know we find a Byzantine artifact arriving to Massilia etc well it doesn't really mean much again we don't know about the quantities most of the times but we realized there had been a brusque contraction uh, that generally speaking the problem also of exports from Africa had been a big deal for the Italian Peninsula, the, the Gothic War had that the Gothic War had also destroyed, so probably demand had also fallen, and it was much much of a more local based production. Uh, the 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 pandemic arrived and it was devastating by some by by significant but by some degree, right? Literally, we we have difficulties even in there to access um, the uh, to to even properly found our statements archaeologically but again we know from the broader issues that these civilizations faced politically so socially military that it was a moment of broader instability and economy of course goes wars at that point people kind of fall back on their kind of local resources more just making attempts in that sense so um the um you 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 can't quite say okay well in the, there was an area where in the, even in this major changes for the time beings were again that are very different from ours right that uh have a much lower in fact uh growth rate in the first place oh look there is a major change from amphorus in the, in the 6th century from the 7th and so we can surely understand this 
uh, you know, the, the stapology means that there was more wealth around. I mean, it can even be guessed, but assessed clearly, really not. You can't do that. Uh, we just have a broader trend, and the trend there seems more eloquent, right? Uh, politically. Um, totally. From we, we get mostly from the written records. The, we'll say, widespread use of amphorae as containers throughout all this period, together with the tendency to ship pottery as a convenient space filler alongside other more valuable, valuable cargoes, also means that ceramic distributions are likely to be indicative of general patterns of exchange, not merely of networks peculiar to the pottery industry. And we have, na so, as we were saying before, there is a deeper connection than just that type of, of product being exported and being traded in the first place. Also, most of our evidence is coming from Africa and Syria, and respectively from fineware pottery and amphora. And about this we could say, but what do we know about other provinces? Maybe they exported significant goods as well. Well, as we were just saying, say, the, um, the ceramic distribution is also likely to be indicative of general patterns of exchange. So again, you wouldn't have a country that just exported fineware pottery or, or amphora. But still, there is a difference between these regions as well. And they're not, absolutely not easy to understand. And again, that mostly depends on our finds. It doesn't depend on how it was at the time. So, again, can do you realize how unstable the ground on which we are really is? Um, at the same time, uh, such perspective distortions are unlikely to be entirely misleading. Uh, because we know historically, of course, of the importance of Syria and Africa. In Africa, I mean, literally the, you know, Roman Africa, the later Ephraimia, because um, of the first of all the broader relevance they had as provinces uh, in the in the Byzantine government, the case of Africa, even in the reconquest, and how important this was for supplying Italy, for example. Same can be said about Egypt or Constantinople, but we don't have such an important evidence for Egypt as well. And about that we have to think that most of this long-range trade was just floating on a sea of a much more intense and taken in the, uh, you know, all together from the various provincial contexts uh, much more important, in fact, trade, right? You didn't have to import fine ware only from Africa or amphora from Syria if you were, I don't know, in Spain or Italy. Um, there were much uh, more direct commercial circuits. And if you think about the Tyrrhenian Sea, uh, you think about the, the Balearic Islands, and uh, southern France, and the connections also between Spain and, and Africa, and so on. I mean, we're talking about all a, a type of, of economy that naturally is also less trackable by a degree, because, again, the scale of the trade was less likely to leave such massive amount of fines. But even there, it, it's a relative... Mm, it's a relative point because again maybe they were exported in very large numbers and again how this happened we don't necessarily know we can't go by um, by hypothesis we can't say generally speaking that the larger and the, the longest ranged uh, the longer range the trade and the more the evidence for it statistically probably 
um, probabilistically. So, but again, we don't even know in the sense how all the system really worked, how, where these products were stored um, generally. We, we, we lack really the knowledge about the single places, about the single sites. So we just guess in many ways and we're very, if, if we were aware of the broader picture, it would probably overwhelm us. Right? It pr would probably again follow the patterns that we have traced so far by a certain degree, but also would make so much else appear that most of what we know is also kind of the tip of the iceberg rather than, than anything else. And um, and of course, when we talk about such important fine wear and amphora traffic volume, we we know that this was connected to the uh, to to kind of a, an industrial scale production and distribution of wine, oil, the same pottery because it had to be produced. You know, where or not. So this all is acceptable as a general interpretation. When we want to pinpoint, however, this the system on around geographical areas, speaking of fine spot um, distribution, for example. Um, and also there even how do you map that as there is the ac an accumulation of statistical evidence how do you classify the finds and how do they interplay with each other and how many archaeologists agree with one another regarding where for example that specific type of um, a product could arrive from right because it, it could even reflect a dominant type of artifact but it could have been co emulated right and again as we were saying before that there was hardly um, a real standardization and even when there is it, it it is at such simple levels that it, they could have been copied also elsewhere so it's it's extremely complicated to sort out um, the Britons tell us stories. They used to say, I went there, I saw this, I bought this, if we are lucky. Right? We know, I've seen this. And so we know that the local elites especially uh, you know, traded uh, extensively on, on longer distances and so on. So we can see also much, much, more, much poorer indicators. And so at least there we have someone that has wanted us to know that there they had those specific things and this is quite crucial in in a in an interpretational sense because people say but this is just somebody saying uh, it's not like a material evidence but very often this is by far more informative and objective and useful than the type of material evidence that we can even think to collect Right, because generally speaking, why would people also lie about this, especially when there is a pattern, and this pattern is evidently connected with, you know, the also what diff different sources would talk about, and what is really plausible because it's supported by other sources around other, again, also archaeological evidence. The question is, you know, we ha we have we have this. We're lucky to have it. Why shouldn't we go without it? Because this is a synthesis. It's not just, it can be, in a sense, uh, of course, incomplete and all. But still, it's kind of the most relevant thing most of the time somebody could tell us, right? Naturally, there are also much more interestingly precise type of documents that, however, are, in this sense, really distressed detracting from, from the world picture. We can have much more technical evidence in a way, but even there it may be very contingental and not really connected with the 
uh, I mean, it would be still connected with the wall, but it's not representative of the wall. And so even if it seems much more juicy evidence, it is still uh, the pinnacle of something else, the tip of the eye of, of, of an iceberg that we can't uh, see overall. And to be quite banal, whenever we find anything, we still do not know about pottery. It doesn't matter how much identification, dating, particular types of pottery has um, advanced, and these advances have been remarkable, but it really remains a matter of interpretation precisely how, why, and for whose benefit such items were transported around the Mediterranean, by which scale, whatever. For example, there is a Provencal hill fort um, known as Saint Blaise, whose inhabitants, as excavations have uh, shown, had reoccupied in late antiquity, in, in a process of you know, proto-encastellation, if you want, um, and that shows in the late 6th century the capacity of acquiring imports from distant regions of the Mediterranean, at least up to that point which is also meaningful because it does show that there were some significant changes and this is also the point, there were, there were changes going on all the time so we mostly see trade like, you know, okay, there are two cities let's say there are on our original level importantly connected, say, Roman Carthage and, and then you say, well, okay, this trade must have been going on normally, right, since ever. Well, not really. <laughs> like, trade was always present. It was kind of, even in moments of war and of piracy and whatever, as there were at this point, especially with the Islamic invasion, it was always there. Uh, enemies traded at the end of the day because they, they needed, even if they weren't at, at war openly, but still. And the, the political gain between all these various provinces very often were decentralized, especially speaking about the, the one of the former Byzantine empires, you know, they, they gained an ever more autonomous administration and, and so on, they sometimes even uh, interacted with the enemy. Think about Euphemius that we have seen in Sicily that had connections in Africa, in Islamic Africa himself at, at a point. We've seen, I don't know, Frankish counts of, uh, of, of Tuscany and of Corsica that made piracy launching raids in Islamic Africa at the same time. It, it was, was later compared to this, the times we discussed today, but just to make you understand how, how fluid the situation was uh, and how uncontrollable it was. For example, when the Longobards migrated in Italy and some of them occupied Pisa, let's say, and there were uh, the dramas of the imperial fleets, and the Longobards seized them. And we know from letters between the, the Pope, if I'm not wrong, and the Bishop of Calaris in, in southern Sardinia, so say, be aware that there are Longobard pirates. Say, so it doesn't even say that there were Longobards, but we kind of know that, right? With history, you can't go by that because it, it's plausible. And of course, it was mostly other people who did this. It was mostly the same Italians who did that with the long birds, by the way. So everything takes on some, you know, if you don't study politics, and that, that's why most archaeologists fall short of expectation, because they are normally, it's not their, f I mean, it, it's always their fault as anybody's, but let's say there's been a materialistic, mechanistic, structuralistic, relativistic idea of, let's say, let's base ourselves just, you know, on the material evidence. And if you study just material evidence, you just find your, this amphorous in front of your eyes, you can hardly, and if you're not sensitized, this is the point, to any other thing, and especially to politics, which is what history is, just in, in itself, you, you cannot really have a, a very uh, concrete insight of the complication of the matter because trade does follow that pattern economy largely follows that, that pattern right so um, it's all extremely complicated and you may never know whether for example be uh, behind the absence of a certain product there is a, a major war 
or um, maybe just the, I don't know, just stop producing it because for whatever reason th doesn't seem to to satisfy the customers anymore or something else was coming about that we, we don't see even because most of the of what was happening is also unseen anyway as the causes not as even just the ethics history archaeology should be trained to think not so much about the consequences but about the causes right which are crucial and more important um, we can see from Saint Blaise again in Provence uh, Gaza wine right it was uh, Grand Cru of, of, of the time the Gaza wine yards were famous at the time uh, wine was shipped in distinctive elongated chestnut colored amphora known to specialists as the late Roman amphora type 4 it's a very specific shape and you can't recognize it from there as we've seen before but and there not everything is alike the inhabitants of Saint Blaise also ate from the bowls and the dishes manufactured in workshops that we know is today's Tunisia, so the aforementioned Africa. This is the ubiquitous African red slip ware that we were pointing at before, that is dominant internationally. Again, as we were saying before, in Italy you find it everywhere. Why did Italians actually import all of that from Africa? That was also uh, actually a perturbed area by a certain degree and the interesting thing is that Italy was as well of course as we were saying before and that late antiquity continued in in Africa especially in the coastal cities of Italy the one under Byzantine control and of course the major dynamic there is that Africa was a main uh, a major grain supplier the, 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 gr uh, the granary of Italy since you know uh, since the antiquity but at the same time uh, one could say but you know what, what about the local Italian production and what worked let's say in in Italy was it um, just this let's say the reason why we find this th this where specifically distributed even in areas that were not under Byzantine control you know how how much does it really tell about the exchange between, for example, the interland and the coast, and how much does this put in in relation, for example, the, the the wars that were being fought between the Byzantines and the Longobards at the same time? And um, again, the the datum in itself is, however, relatively useless because we don't know by which extent, right? Finding red ware, uh, African red ware is um like I say indicative of some kind of dependence on or you know by which sides was the local product really uh, needed how much was supplied compared to the local production these are very difficult questions to answer um and we don't know even how this is crucial to how such ware, such material, for example, on, on the sites like San Blaise, had actually gotten there. Because San Blaise, we find uh, again stuff that comes from Syria, from Palestine, and then so who did really ship it there? Because San Blaise wasn't factually even under direct imperial control at the time, even though they, generally speaking, especially in that area, thought they they were. Uh, there, there is a lot of countries in between. There is Greece, there is Italy, there is Africa. So, what kind of um, path did it follow? Somebody had to broker this because we, we I, it's unlikely that, well, okay, it's still possible that some public administration took care of the thing, uh, maybe on some previous you know, connections that existed since late antiquity relying on imperial orders because you have to think these areas were somewhat pressured in their own regard and so they cared very much about the center even when it was very distant to intervene to still be able to 
provide some help because this, that meant that the empire was strong in the area and so was an important indicator also for the surrounding peoples. Um, there, there is a distinction between the ceramics of Africa and the one of Syria as we've seen in origin. Um, that again might have been also much more mixed than we think. Um, and this is conventionally drawn in discussions of archaeological deposits of this period. Um, and um, is normally taken heuristically as useful, at least because it's presumed to, 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 to make the entire point revolving around these major areas as specific pottery production centers. Um, and yet, we cannot use such tracking to the um, to this kind of styles as a proof of direct exchange between the pr producing and consuming regions. Right? Even whether we, we assume that that's also what their their pattern really was. I mean, why wouldn't somebody in Provence ship this uh, further, like, in Central Europe? Or uh, the same, you know, is valid in terms of, you know, wh where did really the Eastern or African popular come from? It's obvious that those were major regional centers because still late antiquity more or less worked there. But at the same time, uh, you know, how don't we know this was connected also to other surrounding areas of production, after all? Um, we, we, we see, for example, that much of the Eastern material found its way onto Western markets via intermediate ports such as Carthage. Consider that, at this point, the south of Spain is, for a long time, connected with, the, uh, with Constantinople as well. There are also few Mediterranean shipwrecks at this point that can be imputed to a decline in traffic, but also in the uh, reduction in size of the ships that, as we've seen, was a thing also in the Imperial Navy, and this was probably reflected from a civilian point of view, but even in there, by which measure, we don't really know. There is no math to it. Um, so, what we see, however, in this few shipwrecks is that the cargoes are generally heterogeneous, right? Uh, this emphasizes, also again, maybe it's random, maybe we found the most diverse things by chance, but archaeology says, well, this emphasizes the diversity and complexity in exchanges. Um, and thus also telling us that probably it was in fact, as we were saying before, at the provincial scale, so much more interaction than we think. Again, I it's crucial to understand also who really exported these things or imported them, because again, somebody, ha somebody has to move. Mo many merchants are just leaving their own life abroad, back and forth on ships, but Generally speaking, they had to be based somewhere, and they they must have acted as media, still, say, as entrepreneurs that controlled the 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 traffic from either one place or the other. Um, so, whatever stories we get, also about the broader uh, merchant travels and so on, there are informations about this, there are Jewish merchants around, especially in the western, most Mediterranean. Um, so, again, we find really too much to speculate on, to just say, okay, we arrived to, to a point where we can simply dominate the picture. We really don't. Um, and so we see something very variegated that you cannot really stop even at a given time and say, okay, 
we have at least a clear picture of what happened more or less at this point. No, because also the dating is uncertain. And we can't just approximately connect it even to major events like wars, etc. So it's of relative uh, importance as well. And generally speaking, we are mostly condensating our attention around specific depots, right? That are evergreens. There are, there have been historically many UNESCO projects in places like Carthage, in Saracana, in Constantinople, in the Crypta Balba in Rome. Well, this, uh, of course, is is obvious because it's some of the best evidence. Like it, it's like when we study arms and armor, right? We we I always say we must approximate, and we just have some specific interesting evidence that everybody knows. But then this is just very often it can be also as artistic license in that case. It can be a lot of other things. And so it's obvious that every archaeologist would quote uh, the Crypta Balbi or other areas. But still, this doesn't really tell it all. Right? It's just the most evilly referenced and um, you know, known material. But there is really a lot more that sometimes also lays in states of... Uh, you know, the, for example, during the war in Syria, well, we know that there is stuff from even, you know, ancient Mesopotamia, thousands of years uh, old before before Christ, uh, that is just open. Like, everybody can enter those museums, steal, uh, destroy, whatever. And, uh, and the problem with these finds is that, like, we even lack classification sometimes. We also should take them all and look at them and say so imagine in even in countries like those like how complicated it is to research and to therefore you know think about all the, the researchers that are, that are discouraged that also just don't study about that specific region because they say well okay but if i want to go there and study certain finds uh, let's say i need it right especially for a phd something that has to be very thorough complete etc so I don't know, I, I would rather study Spain, because that's easier to go to and uh, things are, say, well well preserved and all accessible. So this overall, albeit it's, it, it's understandable, it kind of still distorts the view, because you will have, have a, still a disproportionate amount of studies about a certain area rather than another. Nat naturally, this is also the fault of the, of the local countries. Again, there are countries that do not give that much about historical heritage in the first place, or they cannot, or maybe they have so much historical heritage that they just can't cover it all uniformly at her, um, at, in order to provide like kind of a broader picture. But this is true for, for broader civilizations, against how much the West cared more about the ancient world or the, of later times, let's say not the early Middle Ages, and how much actually Western, allegedly legal, say, um, legally acting people, etc., great scholars or researchers of my eyes that, again, come to places, again, like uh, Greece or Italy, etc., because they, they're searching for classical stuff. And again, maybe they find something early medieval that is hampering their diggings, of which they have uh, invested so much money because they have won them. And that would block their, their, their excavations. And so they literally make it disappear. And also the maybe the local, uh, this is not reported to the local police. This is not, um, this is just obscured because after all, who does control the whole thing? And we know that the systems are corrupt, that, um, you know, all over the world, academies very often, especially the, even very often the richest ones are very much involved in this kind of business rather than research, right? So. This creates disasters that we wouldn't like to happen in the first place. So, on, on another day, we will talk maybe of some of the stories regarding this period and this topic um, that we have from written records. Uh, or mm, maybe we'll do something else regarding, in fact, written records in general, like broader history and how they connect 
with uh, archaeological finds. For today, however, I stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.